John Hubers is a professor of religion and director of the Global Education Department at Northwestern College, which is in, Ar in Ar Orange City, Iowa. It's an RCA college. He got his PhD in the area of world Christianity and global mission from Lutheran School of Theology at Chicago in 2013. Prior to that, he served with the RCA mission in Bahrain and Oman and as supervisor to the RCA Glo Global Mission Program in the Middle East and South Asia. His book on the first Protestant missionary to the Middle East was published by Whiff and Stock in 2016. It's not that we didn't want John to be able to be here with us, but that wasn't, John wasn't part of the original plan. John is a wonderful blessing that came along a little later. And so we're going to hear his presentation on where are we now, changing demographics, changing attitudes. Everyone, John Hubers. Thank you. First of all, let me, let me make sure that everyone can hear me clearly. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, well, let me just say how great it is uh, to be in one of my many homes that I've had in the over the years, the one thing James did not mention is that I'm a graduate of New Brunswick Seminary. I also was on the board for uh, about three or four years. Um, so New Brunswick is one of the places that my myself and my family have always cherished, although it looks way different than when we were there um, uh, because you're in this beautiful new chapel. Um, when James and I were at New Brunswick, it was the pre peach crate, of course, the upside down peach crate where we will be having chapel. So um, I was able to visit the new facility earlier this year, and oh, what a beautiful facility it is. So it's so great to be here. And thanks also to Hank, uh, both for um, thinking to invite me, be a part of this, this um, presentation, and James, and also for the, uh, the wonderful um, presentation that he just that he just gave, that gave a wonderful background to the uh, history of the Reformed Church mission, uh, which I was a part of for about 13 years, and uh, actually 18 years, because I was in charge of the work in the Middle East as well. Um, and it's so great to be able to give uh, another side of that story. And this time, another side of the story in a place that perhaps some of you have visited, but maybe uh, quite different from where you are living, your own context. I, I know because I grew up in this little town, I'm back home where I grew up. And when I was in New Jersey and a pastor also in Hawthorne, New York, um, I can tell you this is a different world than the one you're living in. So I want to, what I wanna do today is to say, where are we today, particularly with students? For the past seven years, I've been teaching um, Christian missions and intercultural studies, world religions here at Northwestern College um, in the heartland of America. And what I wanna do is to help you understand a little bit about where this generation, the, the millennial generation is when it comes to this issue of interfaith relations, particularly relations between Muslims and Christians. So I believe that Brian is gonna cut me out, which is great, you don't need to see me. I have a PowerPoint that I'd like to use in making the presentation. You should see it on, this, on the wall right now. The question is, where are we now? Changing demographics, changing attitudes. And I would like to introduce you to my PhD advisor. Um, this is Dr. Mark Swanson, who is a professor of Christian Muslim relations at the Lutheran School of Theology at Chicago. He and I share an experience of an internship, a seminary internship in, in Cairo, under Dr. Harold Vogelar, who um, back in 1980, when I went from New Brunswick Seminary to Cairo, was, um, was supported both by the ELCA and by the RCA as a missionary. And Mark, the year before, had done an internship from his seminary, and I followed him the year after. And I was privileged to be able to study under Mark Swanson um, at the Lutheran School of Theology. Mark has a chapter in the book that you see on the wall there. Wonderful book, let me recommend it. This is a book that's produced by the ELCA to talk about what 
Lutherans um, are doing in terms of interfaith relations in the United States. And it's, it's a lot of stories of congregations sharing their experiences. And among the chapters is one that Mark wrote. And I just, it's such a brilliantly insightful chapter on where we are in terms of interfaith relations. He's writing specifically out of the Lutheran experience, but I believe it also is reflective of where we are as a Reformed Church as well. But what I wanna do is share what some of the insights from what he writes, and then talk about that in terms of my own students here at Northwestern College. The name of the chapter in the book is New Realities, New Thinking Since 1990. And what he does is he kind of surveys where ELCA congregations have come since 1990. And here's a quote from the book. Um, in Lutherans and the Challenge of Religious Pluralism, which was a, a study that was made by the ELCA of interfaith attitudes in the Lutheran Church in 1990, there is a sense that the encounter with people of other faiths was for most, most North American Lutherans, other than missionaries, a fairly new thing. Today, however, North American Lutherans, including our children and young adults, are more and more experiencing dialogue with people of other religions. And the reason for that is simple. Um, America has changed since 1990. Uh, the Pew the Pew Research people have done a lot of work recently on looking at the demographics of various religious groups in the United States and also the world. And what you see on, on the right there is some of their findings in terms of projected growth of the various religious communities in the world. On the left side, you see, um, you see the, uh, the percentage of of um, the various religious groups. And what you'll notice is that Muslims and Christians are projected to continue to grow at great numbers up until 2050. Other groups less so other than Hindus. Um, the Jewish community is basically projected to stay about the same. Buddhists, at, if anything, are going to be reduced. Um, folk religions, which is kind of indigenous animist religions, also not much growth. Um, a lot have been said recently about unaffiliated. Notice that percentage-wise, in terms of the world's population, it is projected that they will actually decrease rather than increase. But if you look on the right side, this, this is very telling. There is a, if, if the trends continue as they are right now, by 2050, they believe that the percentage of Christians and Muslims in the world will be nearly equivalent. Right now, when we break up the world's population, about 31% are Christian, 23% Muslim, by far the two largest religious groups in the world. But in the next um, generation, really, the next 40 years, we're going to see an equivalency between them. Um, Hank made a point of saying that the, the world religions are not going away. Here is proof that what he says is true. And uh, demographics uh, clearly are pointing to the fact that the reality we will be facing and this generation faces is of a growing uh, plurality in the world and also a growing plur plurality in our own country. Another set of statistics here. Now we're looking at the United States and particularly at the growth of the Muslim community in the United States. Um, if you look on the left, you'll see from 2007 to 2014, the percentage of Christians in terms of the population in America has decreased by 7%, whereas the percentage of Muslims has increased by 0.5%. And if you look at the right side of the chart, um, the American Muslim community remains fairly small, but what you'll notice is that in terms of the three largest religious groups in the United States, um, again, projected by 2050, the Muslim community in particular is going to be the largest of the religious communities in the United States. Uh, another arrow just popped up. There's that unaffiliated number. There's a lot of discussion about this right now. Um, certainly at places like New Brunswick, because that's the community that our, our students are going to go out and minister to. 
Um, and that is certainly a number to pay attention to. One thing to note here, in a, in a secular, growing secular society with growing unaffiliated people, the relationship between Christians and Muslims, if anything, is going to grow closer. Because what Muslims or Christians are more and more going to realize is that we as people of faith are going to be facing many of the same challenges in trying to uh, perpetuate and pass on our faith and our values to our children in a growing secular society. In my relationship with uh, imams, uh, both in Chicago when I was doing PhD work and also in Texas, I was a pastor in Texas as well, got to be very good friends with a, an imam at a mosque that had about four or 5,000 members. Um, we often had conversations about the, the challenges we faced in trying to keep our children in particular um, faithful to the values that we wanted to pass on. And that very growth of the unaffiliated number means that we could see that Christian Muslim dialogue is going to be, get to be more important as time goes on. And by the way, just in your own area, these are statistics that are interesting. 90% of Muslims in the state of New York live in New York City. And here's a very interesting statistic. 23% of the total Muslim population, which is about four or five million in the United States, lives in New York City. So in every sense of the word, Muslims are your neighbors, they're our neighbors. So now let me bring you to a place that's very different from New York City. Believe me, it is very different from New York City. This is my town, that's ours campus. Um, I wish it looked like that right now. Yesterday we had 10 inches of snow. I'm, re I'm ready to move back to the Middle East again. Um, Anyway, I'm hoping that within the next few weeks, our campus will look like this again. We have 1,200 students in a town of 6,000 people surrounded by cornfields and bean fields. This is the heartland of America. The building you see in front of you there is, is Zwamer Hall, and there are Zwamer Halls everywhere. This one, interestingly, is not named for Sam Zwamer. This one is named for one of his 12 siblings who was a missionary among Native Americans here in the Midwest. Um, that building was built in 1882 when Northwestern was founded and it has um, served the community particularly as a four year college since the 1960s. Our students uh, come from all over the United States and we have international students as well, but mostly from uh, smaller towns um, here in the Midwest, Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, Iowa, Minnesota. Um, so there is some diversity among our students. I wish there was more diversity, but truth told, the demographics of our school very much represent the area we're in. It is mostly what I would call moderately conservative white Christians, many of whom come from very conservative backgrounds independent churches, mostly evangelical churches, are actually our reformed students are only 18%. Um, so we used to be almost entirely a reformed church school. Now it's a much broader demographic in terms of religion, or in terms of Christian affiliation, um, which makes for new interesting challenges. Um, but most would have kind of a generic evangelical uh, background, uh, which means that there's little personal interaction with people of other faiths. However, just recently we've seen a, a small number of students of other faiths starting to attend our school, including two Muslim students, uh, two wonderful uh, uh, young people who I've gotten to be very good friends with. Uh, the girl on the left is from Afghanistan. Believe it or not, came as an exchange student to Pella Christian School. That was a challenge for her. Um, and the one, the one on the right is from uh, Tajikistan. And um, also a very interesting student, an older student, 25 years old, he already has two degrees. This will be his third degree. Um, they have some in interesting challenges being at this, at this school that is not only a liberal arts school, but a Christian liberal arts school with the emphasis on Christian. So we do teach 
from a specifically Christian perspective. In fact, students have required chapel uh, twice a week. So it's my job, one of my jobs here at Northwestern College to help introduce these students who do not have a lot of exposure to other religions to the world religions. Um, every semester I teach a course on um, introduction to world religions. And as Hank was mentioning in, in his uh, talk, one of the things that I do um, in helping them understand about religions, I can't just go to the mosque next door or the temple next door. Um, I Skype in a Buddhist monk. I Skype in a rabbi friend of mine from Los Angeles. I Skype in a Hindu professor from Omaha. But on uh, tomorrow, actually, I will be taking a group of students. I'm, my current class will be going to the Muslims Community Center in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And that's about an hour and a half drive. Um, and that is about as close as we have in terms of a significant Muslim population. And that's actually a photo from inside the mosque. And our, my students will be sitting where the picture was taken. We sit in the back during the Juma, which is the noon prayer to observe. Uh, we sit with a wonderful gentleman. He's a, a doctor, a surgeon at, at one of the local hospitals there. He does an excellent job helping us understand um, what it means to be a Muslim in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Growing population. Um, it's a very diverse uh, community. Uh, so my goal is to help these students um, begin to understand who their non-Christian neighbors are. And one of the things I do with them, in fact, one of the first classes I have with them is to talk about, again, something that Hank referred to um, in his talk, which is the various perspectives that Christians have when it comes to how we understand people of other faiths. Uh, the classic way of talking about that is to use three terms, exclusivist, inclusivist, and pluralist. And uh, the assumption, of course, that I'm sure you have, and my assumption also is that most of our students are coming out of the exclusivist perspective. And that would be mostly true. Many of these students come from churches um, where that would be the approach. Um, I prefer to use uh, categories that Catholic theologian named Paul Knitter has developed in his book, The Theology of Religions, uh, partly because it gets rid of the pejorative word exclusivist, mostly because we're now living in an era, era of postmodernism, and the fourth category is needed to describe a, a new approach that Christians are taking to pluralism. Um, that comes out of a postmodernist paradigm. Um, replacement is the word that is now used to speak more about the exclusivist view. Uh, complete replacement would be talking about how Christianity, we have one goal as Christians, which is to completely replace the religion of our neighbors with the Christian faith. Um, that's certainly the kind of attitude that Samuel Zwamer went out with when he went to the Middle East um, Initially, although I've done research on Zwamer to show that he began to move away from that uh, exclusivist viewpoint later on in his ministry. But that's uh, replacement is what it's called. So we're, we're replacing the faith of our neighbors. So we are called to do that. The second is, is one that is more reflective, perhaps, of Roman Catholic perspectives, um, replacing the word inclusivist. Fulfillment. The idea here is that the seed of the word is present in the world. And that it's very possible that Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims are actually interacting with the invisible presence of Christ in their own community. That the voice of Christ and the grace of Christ is found within the major world religions. And um, Karl Rahner, who is often seen as as the one uh, who has promoted this viewpoint the most, um, mid 20th century Catholic theologian, uh, talks about anonymous Christians. So that there are those who may never hear the name of Christ and yet are responding to the, the presence of Christ, the, the seed of the word that is present within their own commitments and could in fact 
come to a, a point of salvation from within their own faith tradition. Um, by the way, the Catholics don't quite go that far um, in their understanding, but they do lean more in that direction. Um, mutuality is the John Hick school of we're all climbing up a mountain and going towards the real. Hank referred to this, that there are many different ways of looking at one divine reality. All of us have incomplete understandings of that one reality. We're all reaching for the same thing. Um, and so there is a mutual spirituality that we share um, among people of other faiths. And then finally, the, the postmodernist one, which I find intriguing. I did a lot of reading on this in my PhD work. Um, S. Mark Heim, who teaches at, at um, the seminary in Massachusetts, got to think of the name now. Um, anyway, is one who promotes this. And he has a book called Salvations with an S. And basically, the idea from this school is that truth is varied. There is no meta narrative that can link all truth. Um, truth depends on where you stand. Therefore, all religions, in and of themselves, within themselves, have a valid truth. Um, and we have different salvations. So if I'm a Buddhist on the path to nirvana, I will reach nirvana that God himself has built into his creation a plurality. Um, so the religions all exist side by side with their own truths, and all those truths are valid, even though they appear to be contradictory. Now, we could spend the whole time going over these viewpoints, but you can imagine how some of these hear, uh, sound to the ears of my students who are coming from a more exclusivist replacement sort of modality. Um, this always kind of blows them away. I find out from other professors after we've had this session that they're talking about this for like two or three weeks afterwards. So it's it's something that that um, gets them to thinking. And here's the observations I want to make. In the seven years that I've been teaching this, this class, although many of the students have come out of uh, backgrounds that are definitely more exclusivist in their approach to people of other faiths, in fact, when it, when they begin to write their papers, when they begin to respond to my teaching and helping them understand what people of other faiths believe, many more of them are moving towards more pluralist understandings. So yes, their parents are reflecting that, but even in this very conservative Midwest environment, very evangelical, we're finding that young people, this generation, are moving more towards a dialogical model. Um, Hank, in, in the last part of his presentation, talked about how the Reformed Church has been moving in that direction. I'm finding it even among these students who come out of non-RCA, more evangelical backgrounds, they're moving in that direction. And basically, they're moving in a direction where four areas that Mark Swanson develops in his, in his chapter are really speaking to where these students are. So what I'd like to do is kind of present these four uh, perspectives that Mark shares in light of what I've seen with my students to say that I believe that where many students are today, even those coming out of conservative evangelical backgrounds, is moving away from those older exclusivist models to a more, if anything, a more inclusivist position, even moving even further towards a more pluralist position. Um, so Mark says he, there are four areas in which during these past years, 1990 to 2015, which when, when this book was written, Christians who have been reflecting on encounters with people of other religions have discovered wisdom in the Bible and in ancient Christian practices. Um, in the midst of that dialogue that has been thrust upon us by the plurality that is now definitive of where we are um, as a nation, um, Christians are being forced away from those earlier models of exclusivity towards these four areas. Number one, speaking truth. Here's a quote from Mark. In the midst of swamps of poisoned words, not only about people on the basis of their religious beliefs, but also on the basis of race, 
sexual orientation, or political affinities, Christians have been struck anew by the Bible's call to be speakers of truth. I was quite heartened that one of my um, more conservative students, um, when we went to the mosque last Friday, because I'm also teaching a course right now on Christian Muslim relations, and I took that class to the mosque last Friday, when I asked him to come up with a question, the question that he asked the doctor who was speaking to us was, how can I help counter the distorted views of Islam that my friends hold? What he was looking for from this Muslim was, please help me deal with Islamophobia. And what I find among my students is they are disturbed when they hear people, even in their own churches, um, developing distorted perceptions of people of other faiths. Um, at the forefront of where I think this generation is, are people, certainly in our churches, are faithful Christian people who are saying, we must be people of truth. And people of truth need to know the truth about our neighbors. Um, I often say when I'm speaking to groups about Islam, that we have to realize that every time we pass on uh, distorted truths about our neighbors, we are breaking one of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbors. And what's heartening to me is that this generation is getting that. Second, Mark talks about an, an, a new attentiveness to the outsider. If we can refrain from the temptations I just got to notice uh, on my phone that my time is getting short. Um, so let me wrap this up as quickly as I can. Attention to the outsider is to say that the biblical message says that God speaks to us through people of other faiths. And that we need to listen for the voice of God in what people of other faiths say to us. And this generation gets that. They are attentive to those voices in, uh, when they meet Muslims or meet Hindus. They realize that they might be hearing the voice of God speaking to them through those people. Third, hospitality. Um, and I'm just gonna put three and four together. Hospitality and pilgrimage. Both talk about how this generation is eager to meet people of other faiths and to get to know them as friends. We do a semester abroad in Oman through the Alamana Center, which was formed through the work of the Reformed Church. Every, um, every year, a group of my students, um, when I say my students, I'm in charge of global education as well, spend an entire semester studying Arabic, Christian Muslim relations, Islam, and they come back transformed by that experience. One student actually was so transformed, she converted to Islam while she was in Oman. Um, that doesn't happen often, and if it did, uh, I might have problems with this program, but they all come back um, saying that their pilgrimage into the experience of their Muslim neighbors in Oman um, has broadened their understanding of their own faith. How are we transformed? Many of this generation in their encounters with people of their faiths are finding their own faith transformed and expanded through those encounters. So I'm going to stop there. I probably transgressed my limit. I wasn't watching the clock. I don't know if we have any time. James, do we have any time? Oh, thank you. We do, we do have. We can take a couple minutes for questions. Um, as okay. you ask your questions. You're going to have to state them, uh, James, right yeah. up to the microphone because um, your, your voice is, is kind of breaking up. OK. This is the mic. So any questions? Uh, but I, if you could speak into this mic, that would be Oh, fine. OK. I'll do it here. Cool. OK, questions? We're struck with, we're struck with an unusual silence. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, John. Yeah, come right up here. Hi, John. It's, uh, it's John Coakley. It's been a while since we, uh, um, since we talked. Oh, yeah. Good, good to yeah. see you again. Yeah, nice to see you. Um, just as, as I was listening, um, I, and you mentioned Harold, Harold Vogelar, and, and I, yes. I, I think I noticed um, a, a, 
a common denominator between what I heard you saying and what I used to hear from Harold, um, which was often a sense from his, um, from his experience and mission that, that Muslims and Christians um, were really called to make common cause against what I, neither you nor he said was the enemy precisely, but, but maybe it could be characterized that way, namely secularity. That, yes. Uh, that that the, if you think of a kind of binary opposite behind um, the the uh, um, uh, the kind of paradigms you you set up, would you would would you agree that that it's it's that um, it's that conflict that tension uh, between faith on one side and secularism on the other um, that kind of underlies it? Yes, I, I think that's that's a great insight and. I would say, um, I would say there's coming together, particularly of Muslims and Christians, uh, because in many ways, values related to uh, the preservation of the family, values of making certain that that um, a loyalty to God and wanting to allow our faith in God to determine the way we live our lives, that that that's a commonality. Yes, we 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 interpret that differently, but the pressure of secular society on religious communities in America, I think, is something that does, in fact, draw us together. And I would even expand that further. I think that's true with Buddhist families. I think it's true with Hindu families. Um, and, and so while some might hesitate to say that, to uh, say that our mission is to help Muslims uh, retain their, their strong faith, um, if we care for them as people and families that don't want to see their children um, slipping into some of the worst um, excesses of a secular society, particularly related to drugs and sexuality, um, relationships, um, violence, um, certainly I think we, we might even say that we do have common cause. And when I sat with my mom friend in Texas, we would we would get together over a meal, and most of our conversations talked about pastoral issues. And he, as an imam, uh, the role of the imam in the Middle East is not a pastoral role, um, but in the United States, they're more and more having to deal with their congregations the same way Protestant pastors do. And this particular imam asked me about taking courses at Baptist Theological Seminary on pastoral care, because he, he hadn't been taught how to do that. And what always struck me is how we, we immediately felt a bond in terms of the fact that we were called to offer that kind of care to our, to our congregants. They don't use the word congregation, but in a sense, it's many of the same issues that we were facing. So I, I would say, John, absolutely, there's, there's an affinity there that ironically draws us together. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you. Anybody else? <coughs> John, thank you very, <laughs> excuse me. <coughs> John, thank you very much for being with us. And sure. Thank you. It was great, great to be with you. I wish I could have been there. Norma Coleman James, our next presenter, is past moderator of the Reformed Church in America's Commission on Christian Unity, currently serves on the RCA General Synod Task Force on Interreligious Understanding and Relations. She's also the RCA delegate to the Interreligious Relations Convening Table of the National Council of Churches an ordained elder and past president of Classis New Brunswick. Um, Norma's professional career spanned 50 plus years in areas of medical research at the National Institutes of Health, forensic chemistry with the Drug Enforcement Administration, human resource management with the Christian Reformed Church, and adult education with LaGuardia Community College. 
She is currently attending the Order of Sustainable Faith as a student for spiritual direction and is a member of Spiritual Directors International. Norma lives in Cherry Hill with her husband, Earl, who works in the RCA and has an office in this very building that sometimes he's actually able to get to. Um, and in her free time, enjoys playing bridge and spending time with family, and especially her granddaughter, Azaria. Did I get that right? Yay. Ladies and gentlemen, Norma Coleman James. Well, good morning. I am humbled to, is it already afternoon? Time flies when you're having fun. Well, greetings, no matter what time of day it is. I'm humbled to be part of this panel. I always feel like this when I'm among theologians and educators. So I feel like I'm just a voice, a witness to Christ, but it is a pleasure to be here. I'm also grateful that I have been called into ministry as a believer. My roots, if I can give, we talked about roots and beginnings. My beginnings was Baptist. And they said it was only one baptism, but it took two for me. <laughs> that was back in the day when you dunk, we did dunking in the water but the water was cold, and I fought the minister or the devil, I don't know which one it was, but I got out. My parents were embarrassed, and I didn't know why, but I went back when the water was warm and was grateful ever since. And as we look at where we are today, and you mentioned my granddaughter, and all that has been said up to this point, I look at her world, very different from the world I was born into. And the legacy of my life from the beginning, when Christianity and Jim Crow were partners, It was like this. To where I am today, it's only through the grace and providence of God. My granddaughter, where she sits, and I see her fellow students, I never dreamed that I would see that. James mentioned that I'm in school of spiritual direction. I sat with a young person, my instructor's daughter, and I shared with her when I was her age, I could not sit across from her. It would have been a violation of societal and some theological code because we were different. I said, your father could not teach me. I may not have been able to worship with you. So the world is indeed changing. You've heard a lot. So where does the task force come in? We have a rich history in sitting with Muslims. So why the task force, right? So what purpose do we serve? Let me give you a little background. I was the moderator of Christian Unity. And as we did our work, and Hank, thanks for giving that introduction, the bridge to where I am, we seem to see there, the world is not out there anymore. The world is in our neighborhood and our neighbors. So as Christian Unity, we grapple with How do we deal with this? Where should it be placed in the structure of the Reformed Church? 
is not a Christian unity per se. So after much discussion and a lot of questioning, we felt we should challenge the Reformed Church to look at what's happening in our local neighborhood. But we realized there was no place for that to happen. We had ecumenical relationships globally, but we were sort of silent at home, and home was changing. And that's what gave birth to the idea of us going to General Senate in 2015, and once again, Hank, thanks for the bridge, um, to give a mandate to the Reformed Church to begin to look and equip the churches with some of the challenges that some of the ministers were facing. We already heard, and we were seeing some ministers saying, well, and parents, you know, the world that the children are growing up in, and now you have intermarrying, different religions in one family. The young people are not bound. They're being taught. But like John said, they're looking at their neighbors and their students. So we felt that this should be addressed, but there was no place for it to reside. And we felt it was not Christian unity, because that was not our mandate and calling. So where? There was no place. So what I want to do is give you a little introduction on the task force and not repeat what's already been said, but add to what's been said. We looked at the, the rooted in the rich history, thank you. Um, but we felt that the history was out there, and I was amazed when I served on Christian Unity and had a presentation from Boss and others that would, I had no idea of the history. I didn't realize how we worked in ecumenical relationship with other religions outside of the United States. I had this very narrow view of the Reformed tradition in the U.S. So it was an eye-opener. So what did we do? So what we did was, over the last three years, we have met. And the purpose of the meeting was to do our work in cooperative relationship with the Ecumenical and Interfaith Relations Committee of the Christian Reformed Church. That's one of our partners. And I'm going to share with you some of our, some of the takeaways of that work. So as we began our work, we began to look at the call, what we are called to do. We are called as missional people, called to be instrument of God's saving purpose in the world. It's there. I mean, we're talking about the mandate that we place before the Reformed Church, but the mandate is already given to us. That's nothing new, but we're not living it out. To embody the fullness of God's mission, we are called to focus on two elements constituting a singular call. First, we are called to join in renewing and reconciling work of God in creation. And second, we are called to bear witness to the gospel and the, uh, the way of Christ. So we know that, but we're not living it out here because there was no structure for guidance to work with the local church. So with that, we said there's an urgency that's before us. The grounds for interreligious dialogue lies here in the recognition that the creation and the gospel mandates rise out of God's compassion for all who are made in divine images. 
The dialogue in this case is not attempting to find a common denominator or super religious ideology or avoiding difficult topics that rise out of religious differences, but rather than to commit to the kind of respectful listening and learning that marks the best of human relationship. Mark, I appreciate, Hank, I appreciate listening. When you sit and listen, you're no longer a stranger. Ideology falls away. And you see the image bearer of God. And we said, and as we struggle within our own self, we said, this is a critical point given to the fact, too often, for the motivational of missional engagement with people of the faith. The reason why it's not done? Fear. We're not called to be people of fear. Fear-based reaction in this case is contrary to the spirit of Christ. As it is not, as it is driven not by the love of our neighbor, but by the preservation of self, our immediate community and our nation. So thus were some of the realities that the task force grappled with trying to look at the urgency. Why would we want the Reformed Church of America to even understand why there is a need? So we have to grapple and come to the understanding of the urgency of the nature. And we are becoming a fear-driven society, and that fear has penetrated the faith community. Fear, and we are not people of fear, but of faith. Without dialogue and relationship, then fear overtakes us. So, we said, what are the benefits of an interreligious engagement? We ourselves had to struggle with that. God, call, we feel that God calls the Reformed Church in America is to be open to engage. But how? There was no office, there was no staff, there was nothing to respond to the call to meet where churches and pastors and parents to go. But the amazing thing is, we also said we're looking to put it in a structure, but guess what? It's happening at the local level. Food pantries are working across religious line. Communities in times of disaster were coming together where religion and theology was, was not the issue. It's the humanists trying to survive in one and the same thing. But there was a disconnect on how to equip to take it further, to grapple with the questions and we said, there needs to be a place, okay? And there was no place. So with that, we decided to put forth, before uh, the Christian unity put forth the recommendation to General Senate in 2015 that led the task force, and we were presenting a recommendation to General Senate this June. And the recommendations are as follows. First, to direct the general secretary, whoever that will be, to authorize and fund a position designated as coordinator for interreligious relations to facilitate the Reformed Church of America's interreligious and relations work, including equipping congregations, leaders, and students for missional interreligious engagement. That's one recommendation. The other, consistent with the reform collaborative that the RCA's interreligious work that is being conducted through the Joint Committee 
with the Christian Reformed Church in North America, comprised of a religious, coordinator for religious relations, the RCA Ecumenical Associate, and this is our recommendation, to create a unity where this discussion and ministry can be held and worked on. And so the reason we are making these recommendations out of the uh, Interreligious Task Force states that the work shall be permanently lodged within the RCA structure and not just a project and not just with the ecumenical associate because that deals with our Christian brothers and sisters, but begin the dialogue. Um, it should be in there. The staffing will ensure, uh, making a staff position to ensure that, because without that, it could fall off the radar screen. The staff position will simply be made permanent with the responsibilities of missions appointment and that concerns with interreligious engagement and education. So basically is saying, we want a place within the structure to equip the local church to grapple with the reality where it finds itself. And as we've already heard, some minister said, teach me because I don't know how to do this. Parents saying, my children are bringing the world in our home. The time where I was born into, you know who the other was in some Christian communities, especially in the Reformed tradition? A Lutheran was the other. The Presbyterian was the other. Was it not? We have moved out of that other, but now there's new others. And I appreciate the presenters before me. It's not going to go away. We have a responsibility to the young gen generation coming in. They find their place in the Reformed Church of America to grapple with the reality of their lives not based on my history or the history of others. And we felt it was important to mandate the Reformed Church of America to grapple with us, to live out the great commission that we were called to do, not by the task force. We already had that calling. But to live it out by placing it within the Reformed Church structure with a staff committed to provide leadership in following Christ and mission. And that is our hope with our recommendation. An office within the structure, staffing to begin to lead the church in a new reality that is scary for everyone because we have not been there before. And to walk on faith that this is our calling and what we are to do in the name by the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm open for questions. Yes. There are lots of people who can't hear you when you do that. <laughs> okay. That has always been my struggle. Yes, continue, I'm sorry. Yes, we have grown in a world of others, and it's fearful. Everyone got to Sunday school and to the different churches. But the priest 
in town would have said, you could you would have had breakfast, you could have all come here and had breakfast. Yes. There was one person knowing, you know, we as Protestant girls couldn't have breakfast with the That's right. girls. That's right. Yeah, so this is not new. We create new others. Once we accept another, then we create a new other. And I wonder, why do we have to live with others? But I appreciate, Hank, dialogue. You can sit in front of someone not like you, and if you see that person, they're no longer other. It's an image bearer, not based on theology, but one creator, and not let theology shape how you see yourself, how you see the other person, because we have one single creator, and we should not reject what has been created based on theology. Yes? The definition of other was even worse in my very early childhood in hell. Some of the Reformed churches would not speak to the other Reformed That's churches. Right. <laughs> you know? That's right. This is not new. We have well, I wasn't even Reformed, a Christian Reformed. It was before RCA. Third Reformed would not yes. speak to Second Reformed who would not speak to Third Reformed. That is because correct. The theologies were Different. Different. Family has been split. Wars have been created because the fear of the other. And we are challenging the Reformed Church to answer the call that was given, not the task force, but the call that was given that we are not living out and to equip the structure to equip the structure to answer the new reality because if it's not there, where? Other. The fighting between the churches. That is correct. So, this friends, the RCA family. I mean, enough. so friends, this is not new. Is this a new other? And we want to hold the church accountable to provide a place so the questions we all have can be answered and work together into the fullness expression of the gospel throughout the world. We can do it because outside of the church, globally, we have been doing it. We need to bring it now to our neighbors and to the place of where we live. Thank you. Thank you. In a very short time over lunch, we will have an opportunity for more discussion and more questions and responses to one another. You'll see that we've arranged the tables so that we can all talk together. Our last presenter today is Vicki Eastland. Vicki is pastor of the Brookville Reformed Church on Long Island um, and was called there in 2012 because of her work helping to form the first, is it Green County? In Ecumenical Interfaith Conference Council and um, called to Brookville to help, with, to help the congregation there to wrestle with our children are relating, you know, are more and more intermarrying and relating to people of other faiths. And how do we relate to that? How do we respond? And part of that response has grown into what is now the Brookville Interfaith Campus, there where the church is. And she's going to tell us the story of that. Vicki. Thank you for having me today. I appreciate being included in this and I'm excited to share with you what is going on in Brookville. Uh, I'm going to give just a little bit of a background um, extended from what James had said that led me to Brookville. During my first solo pastorate, which was in upstate New York in Catskill at the Catskill First Reformed Church of Catskill, I was part of the ecumenical, Catskill Ecumenical Council. And Shortly after I joined that council, 
a, a fight broke out among the pastors over the Jewish community wanting to become members of the council. Um, what ended up happening is this message that was sent to the Jewish community in Catskill that if you wanted um, a council, you could go and start your own, but you weren't going to be a part of ours because it's specifically Christian. So another pastor and myself left that council and started the first interfaith council of Greene County, which is still thriving today, and it represents all the faith communities that are in um, that region of New York. And because of that work um, and my involvement with that council, a small progressive RCA church on Long Island showed interest in me, Brookville Reformed Church. Um, they had a relationship with an interfaith community that's made up of dual families of dual faiths. One parent is Christian and the other is Jewish and they're raising their children with a love and respect of both faith traditions. These um, families that were in this interfaith community were loosely connected to Brookville Church and the congregation was looking for a pastor who could help them grow this relationship with the interfaith community. So I think that's what sparked their interest in me and I in them and uh, as James said in 2012, I became the new pastor there. I want to give you a little bit of background about the interfaith community before I, I go on. This interfaith community started in New York City under the leadership of Dr. Sheila Gordon, who is, who's Jewish and happened to marry a Roman Catholic. Dr. Gordon founded the interfaith community in Manhattan in the 1980s, along with nine other interfaith couples, in order to combat the rejection that they were experiencing specifically at that time from the Jewish community. Dr. Gordon recalls that when she tried to enroll her children in Hebrew school, the rabbi hung up on her. So this newly formed group hired Jewish and Christian educators to teach their children about both faiths. And again, this was back in 1980s. The interfaith community ended up growing into chapters in the outlining areas of New York City. Besides Long Island's chapter, there is a chapter that exists in Westchester County and in Orange Rock and Bergen counties and in Danbury, Connecticut. There also was a chapter in Denver that's since closed and a group that used to meet in Boston that's currently reorganizing. So it started in New York City and grew out from there with different chapters, realizing that there were lots of interfaith families in other parts of, um, of the Northeast that needed a place to belong. So when the Long Island chapter started in the early 2000s, they quickly discovered that education for their children wasn't enough. That's what the whole organization was designed to do, was to educate the children about both Christianity and Judaism. But when the Long Island chapter formed, they realized that that was not meeting the full needs of the family. And they, um, it wasn't addressing worship or belonging to a house of faith. So prior to finding Brookville Church, these families unfortunately had experienced great disappointment when trying to find houses of faith that would accept them as a dual faith family. Sadly, they had been hurt and rejected by all of the Christian and Jewish clergy that they had approached. They had gone to several synagogues and um, specifically Roman Catholic churches because the majority of those in those intermarriages were Roman Catholic. That's the largest Christian population on Long Island, so it kind of makes sense. But they were rejected by all of the churches and synagogues that they approached to say, hey, can we come and be a part of you? Will you accept us as a whole family? The standard response when they were looking for a spiritual home was that the church or the synagogue would welcome and accept the Christian half of the family, but not the Jewish half and vice versa. You know, you can come and worship here, but you really can't, you know, be involved then something beautiful happened. Having read an article in the local paper about this group, an interfaith minister who was married to a rabbi who was unaffiliated with any synagogue told her husband that she 
thought that she had found the group that he was meant to minister to. So this couple reached out to the interfaith community on Long Island and the group hired the rabbi to perform high holy day services for them. So they had found a rabbi, or really the other way around, a rabbi had found them, but they were still looking for a Christian pastor to even that out. After a while, or a little while later, the group discovered Brookville Church. Um, there, I want to preface that there had already been a Muslim community using the church for the last decade. And I don't remember the story of how they ended up there, but they had been holding Quran studies every Sunday afternoon for at least 10 years prior to this interfaith community finding Brookville Church. And the church had also hosted a Jewish synagogue who needed a temporary home. So one of the members of the interfaith community just happened to be driving by the church and saw that on the church sign there were two other groups listed, a Muslim community and a Jewish congregation. This Christian mom of five who was married to a Jewish man thought that maybe the pastor at that church would be open to working with the interfaith community just like this rabbi had. And, then, and they found both a rabbi and a pastor that would perform high holy day services for them because the former minister at Brookville Church began leading Easter and Christmas services for this group. They literally hired these clergy to do these services for them. That's how it started. And that's how it went for a few years. The children of this interfaith community would have classes in a Jewish center in Port Washington and hire these two clergy to lead these holiday worship services for them. But eventually, the pastor at Brookfield Church invited the group to come over to the church and to start worshiping with the church. During my second interview with Brookville Church, which actually happened to be with the co-leaders of this interfaith community, they were invited in by the search team to also ask questions. And what ended up happening is the search teams kind of um, set themselves aside and allowed this Jewish and, and Christian, they were actually Jewish and Christian moms that were volunteering and leading this interfaith community um, interview me. And at that interview, the, church, the search team told me that they were not just looking for the next pastor for this church, but for someone who could help them continue to grow in their relationship with the interfaith community. I remember Pam Golly, who was the, the Jewish mom at the time that was co-leading the group, uh, joking later after I was hired that she was probably the first um, Jew to, hi to help hire a Christian pastor. <laughs> on Long Island, and we would have fun with that. So just as I was starting my call at Brookville Church, the Jewish congregation was leaving for a bigger space, which made room for the rabbi who was working with the interfaith community to come in and start a new synagogue. So that literally happened as I was coming in um, to my pastorate there. So overnight, we became a dual faith home for these Jewish and Christian families. They worship on Sunday mornings with the Christian church and on Friday nights at the Shabbat service. The sanctuary is both their church and their synagogue. And the Jewish ark that houses the Torah has a permanent home alongside our Christian communion table in our sanctuary. Within the first year of my pastorate, I set about the work of simply introducing people to each other building bridges of friendship between the faith groups. We had had these groups like the Muslim group that had been using the space at the church to hold their services, not their services, their studies, um, but they ha weren't interacting with the Jewish congregation that was there at the time, and the Jewish congregation wasn't interacting with the church, um, and so it really, it was really more of a landlord-renter relationship with these groups. So I just thought, we're all here together, why don't we get to know each other? And beautiful friendships started blossoming from there. The rabbi who, um, Rabbi Stuart Paris, 
who's also the president of All Faith Seminary in Manhattan, um, soon after meeting Dr. Sultan Abdul Hamid, who is the leader of the Muslim Reformed Movement Organization that holds their, their Quran studies at Brookville, um, soon after they had met, he invited Dr. Sultan to come and teach about Islam at the seminary. So this was happening in the first year that I was there. My second year at the church, and I've been there six years now, the interfaith community left the Jewish Center in Port Washington and moved their religious education classes to the church, making it their permanent home. One of the first events that we did together as a whole community, because there's four faith communities that are housed at Brookville, was to, to do a sign dedication ceremony um, and celebrate Thanksgiving together. And I think it's the second. It's not working. Help. <laughs> we practiced this ahead of time. It was not turned on. No, no, it was turned oh, on. It was Well, I'll keep going while he's working on that. I had a picture of the sign, um, but you'll see it in a minute. So, so that was kind of the kickoff of us launching as a multi-faith campus. Um, there are the Brookville Reformed Church, which was founded in 1732 and is the hosting entity, the Muslim Reform Movement Organization, the New Synagogue of Long Island, and the Interfaith Community of Long Island. We quickly discovered, after these introductions with each other, that's our peace poll. It's the second, um, second slide. There's our, there's our sign. Um, so after we had met each other, we quickly discovered that we shared the same vision. We all long to bring reform to our respective faiths. We all desired to see bridges of friendship and reconciliation happen between our various religions. And we want to be a beacon of peace on Long Island, a place where our doors and our hearts are always open. I think, I tell people it was like a perfect storm in a good way, because we were all already there and we just needed to connect with each other and quickly discover that those who were leading those various faith communities had that shared vision. So what we're building couldn't happen if one of the four faith communities had an exclusive mentality. All the study groups, the worship services, and the events are open to everyone. Jews can attend the Quran study, and the Muslims are welcome at Shabbat services, and everyone is welcome to attend the, the Christian church services. We really are one big family. We worship in our respective faith communities, but we come together at least three times a year for shared worship and quarterly adult education, where we explore similar topics in our three religions like the spiritual practice of fasting or the role of Jesus in the three Abrahamic faiths, which Hank Lay came and did a lecture for us on that. The interfaith community provides children's classes in both Christianity and Judaism, but we're hoping to add a Muslim unit because we have more and more families that are finding us that aren't just Jewish and Christian. We have Jewish and Muslim families now. We have Muslim and Christian families. Um, I love rubbing shoulders with the other campus clergy and faith leaders with whom I get to dream, plan, study, pray, and serve alongside. The rabbi is married to an interfaith minister who is the spiritual advisor now to the interfaith community. The Jewish cantor of the synagogue is married to an ex-Catholic priest and together they are co-directors of education for the interfaith community. The Muslim leader is not an imam, but he is a scholar and has authored a commentary on the Quran that has greatly impacted my life. And I brought, I brought it because I wanted to read something um, from this. But I'll just tell you before I do that I've had a, I think all of us need to have a personal mission statement. Churches have mission statements. I've always had a personal mission statement. And that statement is that I'm called to love God, 
to love others, and to help others love God more. I mean, isn't that what we're all called to do? But it's been very intentional in my mind since high school. Um, listen to what my friend, my dear friend, Dr. Sultan Abdul Hamid said of his personal mission in the first chapter of his book, The Quran and the Life of Excellence. I see my role in everything I do as a conduit of God's love to the world. I love others because I know that I am loved and I want to share this gift with everyone. Isn't that a universal theme between all religions? I'm so thankful that I found a kindred spirit in my friend, Dr. Sultan. I've had the privilege of performing life cycle ceremonies with both my Muslim and Jewish colleagues. We've done interfaith weddings together and joint baby namings and baptisms together. Intermarriage is particularly powerful in the Jewish community, where large numbers of Jews, six out of every 10, are now marrying people from other backgrounds, primarily Christian. That's one over half of all Jews in America that are marrying someone outside of their religion. My colleague, Rabbi, Rabbi Stuart Paris, the founder of the new synagogue of Long Island that finds its home at Brookville, um, says that Judaism, along with other religions, traditionally preaches strongly against marrying outside the faith. The idea of interfaith education for interfaith children rather than raising children in one religion, faces opposition in many religious institutions. But like Rabbi Paris, I see it differently. How can you possibly reject the love that these parents give to these children? The tools that they give them to navigate life no matter what happens. How lucky are these kids to be endowed with two traditions? We all know that the easiest path for interfaith couples when it comes to educating their children about faith is to do nothing at all. And I've met people in that category that have chosen to take, and take that route. They felt it was too hard to try and navigate teaching and practicing both religions in the home. So the easiest thing is to do nothing. There are other couples who have chosen one religion over the other to raise their children in. The Jewish cantor of the synagogue, who's married to the ex-Catholic priest, ex-Catholic priest because he fell in love, um, they've chosen to raise their two sons Jewish. But for the 35 or so couples in the interfaith community of Long Island, to raise their children with a love and understanding of both of the parents' faith is not an easy road. The intentionality of these interfaith couples and the dedication and commitment they have to navigate this sometimes painful road with their children overwhelms me. Their dedication to hold on to their own faith and to teach and worship in both their children, um, with their children, is something that I think we can all be challenged by. Many of the moms in the group have told me that they didn't set out to marry someone from another faith. They just happened to meet and fall in love with someone from a different religion. Some couples didn't even think about the challenges of raising a family in an interfaith household until their children were born and grew to the age where they would normally be, begin their religious studies, their religious education. And that's when things started to become tense in the home. One family that is part of our community, the wife is a Christian from Germany, and her in-laws are survivors of the Holocaust. They reached a crisis point when their oldest son became the age to begin studying for his bar mitzvah. That's when the couple found themselves at an impasse. The wife had felt that she had given up everything for her Jewish husband. She often felt the shame of what Germany, her home country, did to the Jews. She had left all that she knew to move to America to be with this man that she loved. And now he just assumed that their sons would be Jewish. That was the final line that she wasn't willing to cross. So it caused their marriage to come to a crisis point 
and what did her husband do but stay up all night researching on the internet for help. Researching, trying to find interfaith groups on the internet. And this couple who lives in Queens found only one group on Long Island, and it was our interfaith community. They quickly called the leaders of the group, and now they're one of the most active families in the community, driving long distances to not only bring their children to religious classes and worship services, but also to get involved in the other programs on our campus as well, like driving the kids every Saturday to Brookville to participate in our play practices for children's musical productions that our campus puts on twice a year. They will tell you that the interfaith community saved their marriage. Their son is currently going through his bar mitzvah training, and he'll have his bar mitzvah on June 1st. But starting in the fall, he's going to be taking confirmation classes with the church and will make his profession of faith on Pentecost next year. How is this possible? How can he claim two faiths at the same time? You need to ask him that question. <laughs> Um, along with many of the kids from this community who have chosen to remain interfaith and to embrace both of the faith traditions from their household. His mom officially joined the Brookville Church on Palm Sunday. Whether children are growing up in interfaith families or not, they are interacting with other children from all types of religious backgrounds. To teach children two religions or more is to equip them to navigate a multi-faith world that we are now living in, one that they already in, uh, interact with on a daily basis. It's a lot for us as a church to navigate, but I find it incredibly enjoyable. Enjoyable when a Jewish dad asks me why we pass a silver plate during the service and put money in it, or, <laughs> or when a Jewish father is constantly asking me questions about our Christian practices and deep theological questions that he, wonder, he ponders late at night. Be before coming to Brookville Church and multi-faith campus, he didn't have either a rabbi or a reverend that he could ask those questions to. But now he has both. And he looks to both of us as his spiritual leaders. These inquisitive questions have caused me to look at our rituals with fresh eyes and has made me so much more intentional about how I conduct worship. One Sunday I had a Jewish mother come up to me after worship in tears thanking me for acknowledging her in the service. All I did that day was include in my prayer that I knew that there were people there that were not Christians, but from another faith tradition and that that was okay. It seemed like a simple thing for me to say, but to this mom it made all the difference because I acknowledged her presence in our Christian worship service and sent the message that she didn't have to change to be there, that she could just be herself, and that was okay. The model that we are creating is a way to bring life, vitality, and people back into the church. The model is to create an open campus at our church, opening our space to other faith communities to partner with us in building a future that promotes peace and unity, not separatism and isolation. To do this as a church, we have to be willing to be open to learn from other religions, to look for common universal themes that unite us, to branch out beyond the confines of our own religious dogma and communities to build relationships with the other, We've been talking about this, right? To see people in other religions as allies, not enemies, who are working for the same things that we are, helping people connect with God and live moral lives that make for a better world for all. Four years ago, I had the privilege of traveling to the Alamana Center in Muscat, Oman, a Muslim-majority nation, and on that trip, the group I was traveling with visited an, an Omani private school, and we were interviewed by the junior and senior classes. When I shared with them that I belonged to a place where Jewish, Muslim, and Christian communities shared the same space and not only got along but also loved each other, one Omani boy stood up and he said, how is that possible that three major world religions who have hated each other 
have been at war with each other, could be in community together? And I responded, I don't know. <laughs> but all I can tell you is that it is possible because and the entire room of students started cheering. Our countries become a melting pot of diversity. Interfaith marriages are on the rise. This presents a unique set of spiritual needs for these families who now find themselves no longer fitting in the old houses of worship where they once were. At Brookfield Church, we've realized that this is a growing cross-section of our community and the diverse religious needs it presents. Diversity calls for diverse thinking, and Brookfield Church has taken this leap of faith to reach beyond um, itself, to reach beyond itself to begin addressing the complex needs of our community. I believe that what we are doing in Brookville is a model of reform that is saving our church from going into extinction. It isn't that complex of a model, really. It just starts with an open spirit and a willingness to share. What we're doing at Brookville, I think, can be done anywhere. We have opened the doors of our church to other faith groups who needed a home, and by doing so, we've created a place that provides interfaith families, a place to belong, to be accepted, to worship in their own faith traditions, and to grow in their relationship with God. Together, we're living our vision, a vision to build a community of people from different faith traditions who worship separately while finding ways to connect to one another through shared learning and service. According to Reverend Tom Goodhue, former executive director of the Long Island Council of Churches, which I think has the pulse of the religious communities on Long Island, we are the only place on the island that has created this type of partnership. Recorded in the Christian Gospels, Jesus said the greatest the second greatest commandment after loving God is loving our neighbor. To love our neighbor, we have to be open to learning about and from those of other cultures and religious backgrounds. Christians who are willing to be open and to open themselves to other faiths experience their understanding of God expand, which causes a person to grow as a Christian. Needs in the community start being met, and when a church has a visible impact and presence in its community, not only does it ignite the faith of its members, but it also is attractive to others. I'm in no way saying that we figured it all out. Much of what we're doing in creating an open, multi-faith campus is by trial and error. There's no roadmap. We have to create it as we go. But one thing my colleagues on our multi-faith campus and I agree on is that what we're building is bigger than any of the players involved. We're just faithful servants of God allowing God to use us as instruments of peace. Thanks for listening. I just, just want to go through my slides real quickly so that you have a visual of what I've been talking about. You can, we put in last spring a peace poll, and it's really awesome because it has um, Arabic, Arabic that represents our Muslim community, Hebrew for our Jewish community, Dutch, for the heritage of the church, right? 285 years Brookville Reformed Church has been there in English. And the next slides are us dedicating the peace poll. Those are some of my colleagues. That's the ex-Catholic priest and um, his cantor wife, Dr. Sultan Abdul Hamid, the Muslim leader, Rabbi Stuart Paris, and his um, interfaith minister wife, Enid Kessler, and myself. When we dedicated the peace poll, we went in and then had into the sanctuary and then had a, a beautiful um, shared prayer service. And one of the members of our multi-faith campus, Imam Khalid Latif, who is a retired Imam, he called us to prayer with the Adan, the Muslim call to prayer. So that's what he's doing there. And we danced the Hora around the peace poll. We had to get some Jewish stuff in there too, right? So that's us dancing around the peace pole. Yes. 
all three symbols of, of our Abrahamic faiths are represented. That's the Jewish ark that I was talking about. Um, it's permanently housed behind the pulpit. And um, a Muslim, not a prayer rug, but it's a Muslim um, wall hanging that has all the names of God in Arabic there, with the cross. Our slogan is Brookville Church and Multi-Faith Campus where our doors and our hearts are always open. Thanks again. Is there a question or two before we go to lunch and you can ask as many as you want? Yes. This is not a question, but a sharing. Uh, last year, I could, uh, my wife, Stephanie, and I went down to the Philadelphia for Interface Highway to present the University of Philadelphia seminar before the Dr. Jim O'Keefe in Gulf. And uh, at that seminar, you know, I, I always said Korean American or Korean Christians, we just like already, uh, our identity, uh, we have a Christian head and um, uh, Confucian is heart and Buddhist mm. belly. <laughs> I'm not seeing others but accepting we are as a Korean Christians already, you know, Buddhism and Confucianism and Christianity mixed in ourselves. So mm -hmm. that was on my sharing and at this kind of way like, after the WCC we could say that I am Buddhist Christian or I am a Christian Buddhist. Yep. Like a Buddhist Buddhism and Christianity and in the beginning of missionary very exclusivist, uh, uh, you know, uh, mission, uh, mission, you know, theology. We are told that we have to just give up, you know, Buddhist side or the Christian side. So I will share that thing. Yeah, multiple religious belonging is one of the terms that's used now, and. That's something I think we can have a whole seminar on mm -hmm. because it is a movement that's happening and the millennials are, th are leading it, I think. But thank you for that because it speaks to that for sure. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. As I said at the beginning, today sort of get, got formed around our Albert A. Smith presentation um, and Hank's plans for what he was sharing. Um, in just a couple of weeks, the Reformed Church Center Committee will be meeting to choose another Albert A. Smith Fellow for 2018-2019, along with a Poppin' Young Fellow in Reformed Worship and a Hazel Gennady Fellow in... Reformed Church Women's Studies. But um, come fall, there will be a chance again to begin the process if you've got a project you're thinking about to um, go ahead and apply for one of those fellowships and spend some time here in New Brunswick and um, do some learning and do some writing and do some sharing. I, I would draw your attention to the um, events listed on the back of the program today. Um, just a few weeks, we'll have our Women's Stories Day, our second annual Women's Stories Day, co-hosted by the Office for Women's Transformation and Leadership, um, and you'll see some information about that. And then in June, we're having a program that uh, a couple of weeks ago I would have said we weren't having, in part because in June, usually the students are all gone and we don't do these things. But um, I was in conversation with other RCA pastors and others. Um, talking about, you know, some of us in the RCA know that there's been a little bit of stress at recent general synods. Um, and talking about that, but talking about the fact that we have people in local congregations and classes trying to be the church, um, even though all of this is happening, and who need help, you know, and need support, and need to support each other in being the church, and um, in the course of that conversation, I said, well, that's sort of what the Reformed Church Center is supposed to do. And so we found, it, we found a date that would be after Synod, but before some people are going off to the Netherlands for the international school. And it will be a less formal day than we usually have. It will be a, really a conversation, and there will be some people who are conversation starters, but any elders, ministers, others from Reformed churches, even in the Reformed family, because I understand that sometimes Presbyterians and people like that have stresses too. 
um, are certainly welcome to be here for that day. Thank you all.